Riverside Bible, Bible Church. We're glad that you are joining in with us via Facebook, wherever you might be across the country. Join right in and worship with us tonight. And glad that you guys are all here tonight. And if you will, turn to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter, we're in, we made it into chapter 2. And uh, we'll pick up there in chapter 2 tonight. Uh, we're going to look at verses 4 through verse 10. And so we'll read those verses tonight to start with, and then we'll, we'll take a look at what Peter has to say to us about these. One of the things that's been great about this study so far, just in one chapter, is about how that it's, the church realizes how much we are really connected together. Uh, we, we do so many things that separate us, but when we should be focusing on the things that unite us. And we're going to talk more about that in, in depth tonight. So promoting Christian togetherness. That's what this whole study is all about. All right, so chapter 2, verse 4. To whom coming as unto a, a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which is disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made of the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now has attained mercy. Now, I don't know about you, but a lot of times as I read scripture, sometimes it's confusing. Sometimes I don't understand what it's uh, talking about. Did you kind of get that in the first couple of verses that we were reading? But that's why you have Bible study. That's why you have things and helps and things like that. And I have to read these things and I have to study these things out for myself. And, uh, but I'm glad that uh, we are increasing in number of who is here because I like seeing you face to face as we study the scriptures and as we talk about it, I need to see you and, uh, and we need to be here together so that we can talk about it. And if you have questions about it, you can ask questions. And so we're going to cover some things about Old Testament, New Testament, and this is what's so great about the Word of God. And as your knowledge increases of the Word of God, you're going to see how old and new tie together. They're not separate, you know, it's, it's all one book. Uh, the, the Bible is, the Greek word is biblos, and it simply means the holy book of books. So there are 66 books in the Bible, but only one Bible. And so it all fits together. And when we're talking about togetherness, it's important that Peter is combining together Old Testament teachings, New Testament teachings, and how they combine together. We're going to talk about the children of Israel, and then we're going to talk about you and I under grace. And so we'll see how these tie together. We're not Israelites. We're not Jews. But we are members of the family of God. So how does that tie together? And so we're going to look at that tonight. And Peter understood it. Uh, as the Holy Spirit gave him utterance uh, to, to understand those things, and he's put it together in a great and marvelous way. So three things we're going to try and cover tonight. We may not get them all, but we'll try. And that is, again, we're talking about Christian togetherness. So we're going to talk about, first of all, that we are stones in the same building. Stones in the same building. And then we're going to talk about that we are priests in the same temple. Uh, or, yeah, in the same temple. This is going to be interesting for you to understand who you are as a child of God. So when you say priest, you think about the preacher, or you think about, but that, that's, not, that's not it. You're a priest. Every single one of you is born again children of God. And then we talk about being citizens of the same nation. So Peter's kind of breaking it down for us. So in these verses, 
uh, that we are starting out with, the first thing we're going to look at is that we are stones in the same building. There is only one Savior. One. There's not two. There's not many. Uh, there's one. One Savior whose name is? The only one. There is only one spiritual building. What's it called? The church. Every born-again child of God is part of that church. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of that church. He is what binds us together. You and I could not be together outside of the Lord Jesus. He is the living stone, which means raised from the dead, brought him victory, and he is the precious chosen stone of the Father. That's who he is. That's who Christ is. He's the chief cornerstone on which it all fits together and builds together, and that's who he is. And then in verse 4 it says, the verse that we started with, it says, uh, to whom coming as unto a living stone, that's Jesus, he's not dead stone, he's a living stone, but it says disallowed indeed of men. That word disallowed simply means rejected. Jesus was rejected by men why? Why was he not the kind of Messiah they were looking for? What were they looking for? They wanted a king who would rout out a, a warrior who would rout out the Romans and give them freedom. And, you know, they were looking for someone like David. Right. Yeah, yeah. Any, any other thoughts of that? What, why would they, uh, what were they looking for? that they rejected Jesus when he came. Because the scriptures are plain about the Messiah and who it was going to be and who, when, it was going, when he was going to come and how it was all going to fall into place. But they, were, they saw the scriptures, but they were ignorant to the scriptures and they were looking for just what you guys were talking about, this person to come in and take charge. Even when Jesus went into Jerusalem uh, before the week that he was crucified, you guys remember? He went in on a donkey. Not a and what, what's that? Not a white horse. Not a white horse. No. He came in on a donkey, but they were all laying these palm leaves down in front of him, and they were crying, Hosanna, King. Because they thought this is the guy, and this is the time. He's rolling into Jerusalem, and he's rolling in here to take over, and he's going to establish this, and we're all going to. But that's, that's not what was to happen. Jesus was coming to die for them. And the sins of the world and because of the rejection of the Jews that certainly opened it up for you and I to get saved because we're under the day of grace today not under the law the law wasn't done away with what was the law done what happened to the law fulfilled. it was fulfilled or that's right good evening yes yeah, come on in uh, first Peter chapter 2 we're on verse 4. Um, yeah, it was fulfilled. He didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. So then when the law was fulfilled with Jesus at, at the cross at Calvary, it opened up that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Before the cross, who, who was the chosen people? The Jews, the Israelites. And uh, so if you were outside of a Jew... We just preached about that on Sunday, the Canaanite woman. Jesus said, it's not meat to take the, the bread and cast it to dogs. Anything outside of an Israelite was considered nothing more than a dog. And so but when Jesus went to the cross, he died for the sins of the world. And he opened up the, this, by grace, he opened up the door to salvation that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. So when you and I come to know Christ as our Savior, born again, then we became part of the family of God, part of the children of God, the people of God. Linda? So is God still dealing with the Jews mm. differently than he deals with us? Interesting. Mm. There, is, there is a yes and no answer to that. Yeah. Yes, they need to be saved. They need to come to know Christ. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Messianic Jews today who uh, they are simply Israelites, Jews, 
who have gotten saved and believed in Jesus Christ. But so many of the Jews are still looking for the Messiah to come because they've rejected Jesus as being that Messiah. So is he still dealing with the Jews today? Yes. Is he going to deal with the Jews again? The answer to that is yes, too. And we're going to talk about that because we'll kind of tie a little bit of Daniel with Revelation. And we'll talk about that tonight as we get into this a little farther. Everyone is saved by faith. Everyone believes by faith. Just because you were born into the family of God doesn't make you, you have, to, it, the faith of Abraham was imputed to him for righteousness. The Hasidic Jews today are still looking for the Messiah. Mm -hmm. They believe in the Messiah. They're, they're counting on the Messiah. I mean, they're not offering sacrifices, but they're still looking for that Messiah. So in turn, this God's going to have their belief and their faith that they're looking for the Messiah. Do you believe... That anybody outside of Jesus Christ dies and goes to hell? Then you just answer that question. Because you are an Israelite or a Jew does not give you access to heaven. But it did give you access to a lot, but not access to heaven. When they sacrificed in the Old Testament, Yearly, they offer sacrifice of their sin. Did they get their sins forgiven? Just carried it on. They, they did not. Because if the blood of bulls and goats and lambs and pigeons could take away sin, what would be the purpose of Jesus going to the cross? It did not. It shoved them ahead. It shoved them ahead. And so the next year they came and they offered sacrifice for their sins all over again. But when Jesus went to the cross... He died for past, present, future. Did he die for the sins of those who would be born later, born as sinners that need a Savior? Did he die for those that were born in the past that lived and died in faith and believing? Did he die for their sins? Yes. Did he die, did he die for our sins in the present? Absolutely. So Jesus on the cross took care of all of that. But listen... Just he made it plain, Paul made it plain in his teachings uh, to the Jews uh, and to the Gentiles is that we were grafted in. But just because you're a Jew doesn't give you access to heaven. It's through faith in Jesus Christ and believing that he went to the cross and he died on the cross. And that's what the Jew has to believe today. They have to believe just exactly what you believe. So we got way ahead of us ourselves tonight but that's all right all right so we're talking about how that they rejected Jesus as the Messiah and and yet Peter is quoting here uh, uh, from Isaiah 28 and he's also quoting from Psalm 118 that Christ was chosen by God but rejected by men and that's what we're getting in these early verses here of chapter 2 the Jews their real stumbling block was their refusal to submit to the word of God. That was their real stumbling block. And they were stumbling over God's word. Had they believed the word and obeyed the word, they would have received their Messiah and been saved. But they did not. And they did not receive him, and that, therefore, the door was open wide. Today's the same, folks. People refuse to believe and obey God's word today. They stumble over Jesus and they stumble over the cross of Calvary, just like they did in their day. They stumble over the Messiah, not believing that Jesus was him. They stumble over the leadership of God and his men like Moses and, and all the others that were leading. They stumble over that because they simply would Refuse to believe and obey the word of God. Today, it's the same way. When you and I refuse to believe and refuse to obey the word of God, we're going to stumble around. 
we are going to stumble around over Jesus and the cross. Believers, that's those who know Christ, born again, are living stones in Christ's building. You and I are living stones. When someone becomes born again, they become a stone in that building. Every one of us. So do you see how this ties us together? Do you see how Peter's talking about unity and togetherness of God's people? He's, ta he's giving different uh, illustrations and different examples of how we tie together with one another. And so we are in this same building. Peter is writing this letter in chapter 1, verse 1. He's writing to five different provinces. Yet they all belong to the same spiritual house. Because this letter is to them. He's writing to them five different places, and yet they all were part of this same spiritual house, the same spiritual house that you and I are part of. When we were born again, we became a stone in that house, Christ's spiritual house, he, the chief cornerstone. There is unity of God's people that transcends local and individual on assemblies and fellowships. We belong to each other because we belong to Christ. That's, that's the part that links us. It doesn't mean that doctrinal and denominational differences are wrong. Each local church must be fully persuaded by the Spirit of God. You come here because you believe the way that we believe, the way that we teach it and preach it, and we're trying to be led by the Spirit to, to say this is the way we see it, this is the way we preach it, this is the way we teach it, and you say, you know what, I agree with that. And if you didn't agree with that, then you can find another place where they might believe and agree the way you do. Now, we're not talking about the fundamentals of the faith. I feel like I have to keep throwing that in so that we are constantly reminded that there are certain things that we all must believe no matter what denomination, no matter what assembly you link yourself to, there are certain things we all must believe. We're talking about these other denominational differences. Uh, and so may, about, maybe about music. Is it wrong to have a band, live band playing? No, it's not what, it's not for me. But it doesn't mean it's wrong. Do you see the difference? But that's not a fundamental of the faith. Fundamental of the faith doesn't say you've got to sing hymns out of the hymn book. That's, that's not what it is. Tell me one fundamental of the faith. All right, hang on. Jesus died on the cross and rose again. All right, Jesus died on the cross and rose again. I don't care what you link yourself with. You can't believe that any different. We all have to believe that the same. Carol? born of a virgin why is that important sinless life if he was born of an earthly father and an earthly mother he was born into what just like you and I but he did not have an earthly father and it was the Holy Ghost that came and overshadowed Mary and she became pregnant you think God can't just speak the words in a womb have a baby growing inside so it's important that we understand this has to do with the sinless life of Christ you can't believe that any other way. So I don't care what name or label you want to stick on yourself or what assembly you gather yourself with, you can't differ on that. You can't differ on the fact, oh, get this now, because I've heard this differently lately. This is the inerrant word of God. Do you know what that means? No errors. No errors in this book. Now, do you, think, do you think there's contradictions in this book? There are not. Just because I don't understand it, and just because I can't link it all together, doesn't make it any less true. This has no contradictions. It has no errors. This is God-breathed scripture. All scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, we just shared that with the Lord tonight. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and that word means God breathed, and then it says what it's good for. It's good for... Prophetable, and correct, and 
All the things that we need to live and, and, and to govern by is what it's good for. And listen, these men didn't just decide to pin. If you took 10 of us, well, let's, let's, let's go more than that. How many we got? 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There's 20 of us in this room. So if you took all 20 of us, you gave us a subject, and you told us to write on it and put us in different rooms. When we come back together, it'd be the biggest mess you have ever seen. We could sit in the same room and sit in We could do the same. Listen, so how in the world did all of these writers, all those thousands of years through history, put together a book that has no errors? A book that totally agrees from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 and everything in between. How in the world? Well, we know how, right? Inspiration of God. They weren't just pinning what they decided to. You think Paul wrote to the churches just what he was feeling at the moment? He wrote exactly what the Spirit of God moved on him to write that was going to come to you and I in 2024. And be just as relevant today as it was in Paul's day. We look at the Old Testament, we look at creation, and what we know about creation is just as relevant to us today as it was when it was written back in Moses in the first five books of the Bible. And the smarter scientists get, the more they know. <laughs> That's right. The smarter the scientists get, the greater the scriptures become, right? So, uh, it's not these denominational differences that are wrong. Each local church must be fully persuaded. The exception of what we just mentioned, the fundamentals of the faith, you cannot differ on the Word of God and the inerrant scriptures. But it does mean that we must not permit our differences to destroy the spiritual unity we have in Christ. That's not my kind of music, but I'm not going to let that kind of music destroy my fellowship with those that are believers that attend that church that enjoy that kind of music. Are you with me? You see what I'm saying about our differences? Because we're not going to differ on these fundamentals. If someone differs on the fundamentals, what does that make them? <laughs> They're wrong, all right, but it starts with a C and one we don't talk much about. It makes them a cult. Anyone who believes that Jesus was sinful is a cult. Anyone believes that this is not the scripture. Listen, I don't have to understand it in order to believe it. I believe it by faith. Have you seen Jesus? But by faith, didn't you believe that he died on the cross and you accepted that? Listen, we live by faith. That's how we live. One of these days, our faith will become sight. And when we see Jesus face to face, then we no longer need faith because we're looking right at him. But until then, we live by faith. So anything outside of those fundamentals is a cult. I don't care who they are, what religion they want to call themselves, what, what name they want nation will give themselves their cults outside of those fundamentals but inside of that there are plenty that listen there are groups that don't believe in uh, music at all does that mean I can't fellowship with any believers in that church no it doesn't because whether you have instruments in your church or no instruments in your church it doesn't have anything to do with whether you're going to go to heaven or not so, I cannot let these differences drive me apart from other believers because we are linked together by Jesus Christ as our cornerstone and we are all stones in the same building. That makes sense? Got a question? Yeah. You looked a little confused. Are, has this confused you a little?
no such thing. Doesn't exist. Just because they call it that it doesn't make it any less true. Uh, you can't, you can't, that, that'd be like somebody saying, uh, we have drunkards first Baptist church. Yeah, it, 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 it doesn't it, it doesn't matter what you want to call it. Yeah. it it's not going to be a church. It's not going to be that. Because you won't be able to believe in those fundamentals of the faith and be gay, alcoholic, drug addict. Doesn't mean that you, you, when you get saved, you automatically just lost all of that. Some people do. Some people, they, they get saved and they quit something just like that. And then other things, they got to work at it. And they got to work. Are you working on anything since you've been saved? I am. And so we're, we're working on things. But some things, when I got saved, went like that. And other things was work. And it still worked. But you, when you get outside the fundamentals of the faith, you're no longer a church. You can call yourself whatever you want to, but you will not be part of the stones in Christ building. But if Christ comes, if we were seeking for him, we would find him. That's right. So there are people who start out in, in those cults who eventually come to Christ. Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't want to take away from that. Mm-hmm. It, does, it does mean that these differences should not destroy our spiritual unity that we have in Jesus. I'm not talking about people fooling themselves. All right, so we are part of the same building. Now, secondly, and this is a good one. We'll probably, this is probably going to take the rest of the night tonight. We are priests in the same temple. Look at verse 5. Ye also, as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up sacrifices. Now, who's, who's he talking to? Is he talking to the preacher? O- only because he's born again. But he's also talking to every believer. Acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 9. You are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In the Old Testament period, God's people had a priesthood. Do you remember where the priests came out of? One of the tribes of Israel, which one was it? Levi, the Levitical priest. All the priests came out of Levi. But today, see in the Old Testament they had a priesthood. Today, God's people are a priesthood. You and me, Dan. I I look at it like this. Uh, He chose people and he was going to make a, a kingdom of priests and so then they would spread out and uh, bring us to Christ but when they rejected Jesus he come up with grace yeah, so all of that's in our study tonight. Mm-hmm. All right. Listen, these are coming from people that spend time in the scriptures, and they, they understand these things. But let's make sure we don't pass over. In the Old Testament period, only the Levitical priests could administer the sacrifice of these animals. They were the only ones that could do that. They entered into the temple and performed duties at the altar. Only the high priest, though, could enter into what was called the holiest of holies. What was in the holiest of holies? Why was that such a sacred place in the temple to go? That only the high priest, not even just a regular priest could go into that, only the holy of holies. What was in there? All right, hang on one at a time. We got the mercy seat of God. All right, that's in the mercy seat. What was inside that mercy seat? That was going to be my next question. Three things. Manna. Manna. Aaron's rod. Now, let's go back to the manna. Manna was a, 
and how God was able to, because you remember when they wanted food, God gave them manna, little wafers on the ground, and they were to only pick up. Isn't it great, Rachel, that you can't sit over here because there's no room? It's awesome. <laughs> Pretty soon I'm going to have to go up here to teach on this tonight. I like it. Uh, the wafer on the ground that they picked up to eat, how much could they pick up? One day. If they picked up for two days, what happened to it? It rotted, and it stunk to the high heavens. You know, I love the smell of fresh mowed grass. Anybody, anybody love that smell? You take that fresh mowed grass clippings, and you put it in a bag for a day or two, then open that bag and take a good sniff. It is rotten to the core. It's, it's awful. Listen, it only lasted, because he said, I will provide for you every single day. So only take what you and your family will eat today, and I'll provide it tomorrow. And when you get up tomorrow, you'll take your day's supply. Now, on the Sabbath, you'll take up two days' supply. So you could rest on the or the day before. So, all, But they didn't believe God. So they took up more than they should, and it was rotten, and it was terrible, and it was all. So they finally got the message. All right? So... How did God, because he's God, right? In this Ark of the Covenant was preserved a pot of manna to remind them of what God had done for them in the wilderness as they were traveling. And it didn't rot. It didn't go away. It was still in that pot to be preserved. But that's how God works. All right, so that's the manna. What else was in the pot? Aaron's rod. What was important about Aaron's rod? What happened with Aaron's rod? Huh? I mean, what what was it used for? They turned it into a snake and back to Pharaoh. Yeah, I mean, they were using it when they went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go and all of that. So Aaron's rod is in there. Then there was one other thing in there. What was it? The Ten Commandments. The, the Ten Commandments was in there. So inside of that was the Ten Commandments. The tablets were in there. Aaron's rod and a pot of manna. And what was over Cherubims, angels, over it, protecting it. Now, before you get into the Holy of Holies, there was another place that you stepped from the temple into a place called the Holy Place. And then from there, you went into the Holy of Holies. Now, in the Holy Place, the priest, the high priest, offered sacrifice for his own sin. Because what would happen if he stepped into the holiest of holies without offering sacrifice for his own sins? Anybody know? He died on the spot. Now, if you're not familiar with all this, let me just explain something to you. <laughs> they would tie a rope on the high priest's leg, an ankle bracelet. <laughs> so that when he went into the holiest of holies and he wasn't right with God and he dropped dead, ain't nobody going in there after him. That rope was on there to pull him out. They weren't going in there. But that's the way it was set up. That was the priesthood of the Old Testament. And like Dan said, this, God made this so that it would be something that would spread out throughout Israel and they would understand the, the, the glory of God and the greatness of God and they would show that to all the other nations around would understand all that. But they not only rejected because they constantly were going into what kind of worship? Idol worship. They were always falling in, into the nation's sins around them instead of being true to what God wanted for them. Today, each child of God has the privilege of coming into the presence of God yourself. We do not come to God through any person on earth you can go boldly to the throne of grace to find help and mercy in the time of need you me going into the holiest of holies yeah you and I have the privilege of able to do that uh, only through one mediator can we do that? Who's our great high priest? 
He's the mediator, Jesus Christ. We're priests. We have a priesthood. We have a privilege of being involved in this priesthood, and we are all part of this priesthood. Not just Levitical priests. We're all born-again Christians. Believers are part of that priesthood, and Jesus is our great high priest. He's the mediator between us and God, and we go right into his presence when we go uh, to the Lord. All right. So because he lives, he is interceding for us. That is one of the things he's doing. As we minister as holy priests, folks, this means that our lives should be lived as though we were priests in a temple. When he went to the cross, washed all my sins away and therefore I became a priest. What happened when he died on the cross? Something happened in this temple. The veil rent in twain top to bottom opening up that holiest place into the holiest of holies. Open up that area. In the Old Testament each priest had different ministries to perform. Yet they were together under the high priest, serving and glorifying God. And as God's priest today, we must work together at the direction of our high priest, Jesus Christ. Each ministry that we perform for his glory is a service to God. This is our job. This is our life. This is why it's so important. Listen, we can't just continue to live our lives like we think we should. We need to be living our lives as God directs us to lead. This is where the rubber meets the road as growing as a child of God. You're either going to sit still or go backwards, or you're going to go forward. And you're not going to go forward by doing it your way. And you're not going to go forward because you think you know better than God. You're only going to go forward when you have submitted yourself as a priest to God and everything that you sacrifice and everything that you do brings glory to God, then you're going to find yourself moving forward. When you take on the role of priesthood that you have the privilege of being part of as you become a child of God. We offer today sacrifices, animal sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices. Christians today do not bring animals. We have our own sacrifices to God. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It only makes reason, only makes sense to give of ourselves to God who gave himself for us. So we offer our bodies to him. We offer the praise of our lips. We offer the good works that we do for others. Let me just, um, just before, just two books back, in Hebrews, let me just read you a couple of verses there about that in chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. 
That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to God. That's part of what we do. That's part of the sacrifice we do. Now, let me tell you this. You can't curse man and bless God with the same pair of lips. It doesn't work. So if you're trying to live like that, it's not going to work. You can't do it. So then it says in verse 16, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. When you are doing good works and you're doing them for others, God is well pleased with that. How about your money and your other material things that you share with others in, in God's service? Is it a sacrifice? It is. Philippians chapter 4, uh, we're not going to read that because you just read the whole chapter. Paul is, is praising the Philippians for ministering to his needs as he traveled through different churches. Whether he was in Thessalonica or whether he was wherever he was at, they were always raising up some money and different things to help him with his travels, to help him with, with what, whatever he needed in life, and they sent it to him. They always send somebody to Paul, and he's giving them praise for all, all of that that they were doing. Listen, it's a sacrifice. They sacrificed things of their own selves to see that Paul in the ministry was further. Do we not, uh, do we not support missionaries here at this church? I can't go to uh, uh, where these missionaries go. But I can help them who are going, who have the way to go. I can provide means to help them, whether it be uh, physical means or whether it be uh, financial means or, or prayerful means, whatever it is. We make sacrifices to help others in this way. And I do it with my money. I do it with my material things for others in God's service. Even the people we lead to Christ are sacrifices for his glory. And let me read you one more scripture. And this is in Romans. Romans 15 and verse 16. Let me read this to you. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God, the good news of Jesus Christ, that the offering up of Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. When you bring someone to a saving knowledge of God, when you talk to someone about the fact that they need Jesus in their life, and you tell them about the cross, and you tell them about the empty tomb, and you tell them about heaven and you you explain to them how this all works and you bring them to that saving knowledge when they call upon the lord it becomes a sacrifice that you've made to bring them to that place that when they come to know christ it's all done of the holy spirit so don't you get the big head over it understand today and always that you do not save only bring them to a saving knowledge it is God who saves them and we need to understand how that works we offer these sacrifices through Christ because only then is it acceptable to God if I'm offering it through myself if I'm acting like I'm doing something God isn't going to accept that it's only through Jesus that these become acceptable to God We've said this many times. We should say it more often. It's all about Jesus. Everything we do should be about that. The Israelites, by their service to God, were to bring a spiritual influence for godliness to a godless nation that was around them. And at times they did. I want to give you two examples one is in the book of Joshua chapter 2. If you want to turn with me, and that's fine. If, uh, I'll not wait for you. But chapter 2, you can write it down. Verse 9. This is when the spies were in 
Jericho. And this is what Rahab had to say. She was a harlot. She run a, 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 a place where her alcohol was served and, and all kind of uh, illicit sex was going, all kind of crazy stuff going on. But listen, she found the Lord. But listen to what she has to say, verse 9. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water, the Red Sea, for you. And when you come out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were in the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. So, because at this time, Joshua was their leader, and he had just led them across the overflowing Jordan River, and now they're marching into the Promised Land, and they come up on this great city of Jericho, setting up on a hill that you couldn't get to. They, they couldn't just storm the hill. They would never make it. But God had a plan. Do you remember? They marched around once and, and, and blew trumpets. Once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, they marched seven times. And then they not only blew the trumpets, but they shouted. And guess what happened to the walls? They fell flat. And when they fell flat, the children of Israel marched into the city completely destroyed. With the exception of Rahab and her family, who would, because of their obedience to God and to God's word, that had traveled to Jericho and their hearts had fainted because they knew that God was giving them the land because there's no God like their God. And that's what God intended for it to be. They kept falling in, even in going into Jericho. Do you remember what happened in that city? They were destroyed all, take nothing, except who was in Rahab's home. Somebody else did something in that city. Do you remember? Anybody? No, you're in the New Testament. Same deal. Same deal. <laughs> Achan took a wedge of gold and a Babylonish garment when God said, you don't take nothing. You destroy it all. He took a wedge of gold and a Babylonish garment, and he took it and he hid it under his tent. And the next little battle that they had, the children of Israel, after they wiped out this great city of Jericho, they went to a little town called Ai, just a little wide spot in the road. They didn't even send the whole army. They just sent a few men to go up and wipe them out. Well, they didn't wipe them out. They got, they got pack, sent packing and running back to camp. And Joshua falls on his face and says, God, did you not bring me in here to do this? What's going on? And he says, there's sin in the camp. Already somebody has disobeyed what I told them to do. And so guess what happened to Achan? After, after Joshua brought them all in by companies and talked to everybody, tell me what you've done. Achan finally admitted Yes, I took a Babylonish garment and I took a wedge of gold and it's hid under my tent. He said, go get it. And they took him and his wife and his children and everything that he had. And they took them down to the valley of Achor and they stoned them to death and burned them with fire. And then they moved on to conquer in the promised land. But Rahab got a hold of that, got a hold of who this God was because of their obedience to God and because that it came and rolled around throughout the country. I'll give you one more, and it just so happens these are both women. It's in the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1. Ruth was a Moabitess. She was not an Israelite. Neither was, neither was Rahab. They were what they called proselytes. They were raised one way, but believed in God's way and became part of God's people through their faith in believing. And Ruth was another one. And after Ruth's husband had died, and Naomi's husband had died, and Orpah's husband had died, and Orpah went back to her homeland, uh, Naomi tried to get Ruth to go back, but she wouldn't go back because something else had happened to Ruth. And I want you to notice what she says in verse 15 of chapter 1. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back into her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Ruth said... 
Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Here it is. Thy God shall be my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and where there, there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me, and more also, if I ought but death part me and thee. She had begun to believe what Naomi had been living. And she trusted in that God and became one that got moved over. Again, from the faithfulness of God's people living the word of God as it should. But for the most part, the Israelites adopted many of the ways of the godless world, namely idolatry, always going off into idolatry, always turning back, always wanting to go back. Would to God that we had died in Egypt. Well, I'll bet Moses and Joshua wished that some of them had by the time he got through with their complaints. We need as children and believers of God and as this royal priesthood, We need to maintain our separated position in this world. Not that we become isolated because the world needs our influence and the world needs our witness. But if you don't get anything else, I want you to get something. Let me say one more thing and then I'll give it to you. I got a quote here for you. We must not permit the world to infect us or change us. We, the world needs us. They need our influence in all aspects of the world, all parts of life. And they need our witness. They need to hear us talking about the Lord. They need us to hear us talking about the victories. They need to hear us talking about God's Word. They need to hear all of that. But don't get so wrapped up that you, that, and make sure that you do not allow the world to infect you or change you. And they need our prayers. They do. Yes. All right, I'm going to give you a quote from Warren Wiersbe. It's really, really good, so you might want to write this down. Separation is not isolation. Separation is not isolation. It is contact without contamination. And I'll say it again because it's, it's worth repeating. Separation is not isolation. It is contact without contamination. Because we have the privilege as this royal priesthood to go to God and offer spiritual sacrifices and we go to God personally, you don't have to come to me. You can go directly to God yourself. Now, to ask me to help you pray about something, that's great. We, should, we can all you know, bombard the throne of grace together. And we do on behalf of many people, on behalf of our own situations and our own lives and people we know, things that are going on. But I have the privilege to go to God myself, personally, and so do you. But it should not encourage selfishness or individually out, individuality on our part. Because we are priest together I don't need to start getting to the place where I think I'm a priest only and you aren't no we're priests together serving the same high priest and heavenly mediator Jesus Christ we must maintain our personal walk with God there's no doubt about that But we must not do it at the expense of other Christians by ignoring or neglecting them. Oh, they're not on as high a plane as I am spiritually. I can't can't bring myself to lower myself to conversation with them. Wait till they move up the spiritual ladder. You are already in trouble, folks, when you've got that kind of thoughts going on in your mind. 
We need one another. We must share with one another. We must seek out those who haven't moved along where we are, that we might help them come along better in their Christian walk. Not that I'm self-righteous and that I'm better than somebody else and that they're going to look at me and go, that guy's really spiritual. Listen, you already got the wrong attitude about it. I understand that this is my fellow priest in the priesthood. We are together in this. Lady told me one time, oh, well, you're a preacher. You're supposed to, you, you, you get uh, more privileges than anybody else. I said, ma'am, where's that in the Bible? Because I'd like to underline it. But that's different than what she was saying. I said, ma'am, you can live as close to God as you desire. Every one of you, every individual, you can look at somebody else that's moved up the ladder and you can say, man, I wish I was like them. And you can just sit where you are. Or you can say, hey, how do I get there? Let me get more. God, give me more that I can learn and understand and grow and keep moving, that I can move up the ladder, help somebody behind me, drag them up here with me, teach them. We're all in this together. It's not just one person. We are all together. So we need to maintain our, our, our personal walk, but there is no room in the Christian realm, especially today, for the me complex. Are you hung up on me? Too many individuals and churches fall into this individuality being promoted while forgetting about others. There must be a balance. If all I do is try and help somebody else but I never help myself, that's not good either, is it? I don't have any time for my own personal uh, relationship with God and my own personal Bible study and my own personal time to pray and be alone with God. Then it's not, that's not helping me. There must be a balance. But when I understand that we are in this together as believers, we are together. We are together making up the same building. We're just different blocks in the building. But we're all of the same priesthood. We're all in the same temple working and doing together. When I understand that, then I, I get me a balance. I find that time to work on my personal Christian life, and I find that time to help somebody else with their walk with God. Are we as a church doing that? I'm talking about the church as a whole, not just Riverside Bible Church. Are we really trying to help each other or has it become the me syndrome look at me it's all about me we're going to stop right there tonight next week we'll pick up we are citizens of the same nation in verses 9 and 10 if you want to look those over and you can look ahead too because we'll go on to verses 11 through 25 of chapter 2 which uh, let's see that does finish that chapter so uh, so think about that and read about that what I wanted you to get tonight is that we are making up the same building and we are all of the part of the same temple as priests not according to what I say according to what Peter said here in the scriptures. This is who we are. You know, this verse 9 is so good. You're a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You've been chosen by God, folks. You know, he says, you haven't chosen me, but I've chosen you. 
Is it that what he said to his disciples? In John 14, 15, somewhere in there? You, he says, you haven't chosen me. I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. That's what I, I, I've chosen you to do that. We are a chosen people. Do you live like you're chosen? Do I? Do we? Do we understand who we are? Do you feel like you're part of the priesthood? Holy. A peculiar people. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. That you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You belong to God. What a privilege. Children of Israel at many times didn't appreciate it. The church many times today don't appreciate it either. We're not really that much different than the Old Testament. So, um, any questions or comments that you would like to make about something we got on tonight? Did this make it a little clearer about when we first started reading it, it it's a little fuzzy in talking about priesthood and, and sacrifices uh, and the cornerstone. Did you guys, you guys with me on all that now? It's a little better. This is what Bible study is all about, folks. We, we read things and we go, oh, what did that just say? We need someone to say, here's what it says. Let's look at it now. And then we go back and look at it again and we go, okay, I see that. I see that. So I hope that's what you see in this tonight. I don't, you guys aren't yipping and yaying like these guys downstairs. They're having fun. <laughs> uh, Cheap, easy, easy believes it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. If we're, if we're a living sacrifice, we shouldn't be compromised for all of it. It's going to cost us. Yeah. Every sacrifice. It, it's it's our lives. It's the life that we live. I've said this before. Christianity is not a way of life. It is your life. When you become a Christian, that's who you become. So I don't have to worry about whether the world what they think of me. I need to be a, a witness to them. And an influence wherever I am in this world. All right, let me go ahead and uh, sign off on Facebook. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Hope it was a blessing to you. And Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday morning.